Knowledge is power. Well, where do you think knowledge comes from? It comes from experiences that unfortunately are mostly negative. And then out of that out of that experience comes wisdom. And wisdom is, is knowing that next time I won't do that again. That's wisdom. How old are you going to be before you start to experience life like you want it? I want to tell you right now, whether you like it or not, there is a better way to do business. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Business for Builders podcast. My name's Max. I am your host. Uh, if you're a First-time listener, welcome. I really appreciate you dropping in and uh, checking us out. Uh, if you're in YouTube land, uh, hit the bell. One of these drops every week. Would love it if uh, uh, you'd keep up to date with what's going on. I'm sure it's going to do, uh, do a lot for you and uh, your education around biz dev. Um, if you're a long-time listener, I really appreciate you hanging with us and uh, continuing to chime in. It uh, It is uh, super encouraging and uh, it really floats my boat. So, uh, great to have you along. Uh, don't forget, get across to Business for Builders VIP on Facebook. Answer the questions. If you're a good sort, I'll let you in. And uh, that's a great place for some, uh, you know, collaboration. Uh, asking questions of contractors. We're going to cover a bit of a bit of information around the power of community and collaboration uh, and camaraderie as well. So uh, in the next episode or two. So get across there. And um, look, be sure if you want to chat with me a little bit about uh, what goes on in the coaching uh, department as far as EliteBusinessAdvisory.com is concerned, get across there and and uh, hit the book a consultation button and uh, catch up with me for 30 minutes and I will give you all, of I, all I can in 30 minutes uh, as we drill down on what's happening in and around your business. See if we can give you some steak and potatoes and uh, see where to from there. All right, as usual, uh, we want to we wanna kick on and uh, really get in amongst um, – the weeds as it relates to business development and uh, really giving you guys and gals stuff to uh, think about. And, um, you know, because my job as a, whether I'm a franchise or whether I'm a business coach, it's all about bringing awareness, you know, rattling some cages and going, oi, what about this? And then, of course, you move into the area where you really want to provide education, which which leads to revelation because you start learning about things that you may need to do better within your business, then all of a sudden you go, ah, this is what I've been missing or ah, this is what I should have been doing 12 months ago. Like it's really those aha, aha moments and those, uh, you know, things really open up for you. So um, we really want to uh, push into that and lean into that. Um, and then, of course, there's the accountability, and that's a big part of what I do uh, around, you know, when I'm talking about coaching or leading a franchise group, uh, there is a high level of accountability that goes on both for folks within my business, but also for me as a business owner and a CEO, um, you know, I've got to be very much accountable to my business partners uh, and also my franchisees, you know, because they want to know what's going on and, uh, you know, where we're going to. It's up to my job as the as the president and CEO to obviously work hands on in the business a little bit, but the CEO's role is really the visionary. So, um, yeah, we really want to get cracking and, um, you know, see your business grow. And, you know, I think a lot of the time we've got to understand the power of having a very clear vision because without a vision, uh, the business has really not got any direction. So, um, yeah, let's uh, let's get started. So today I'm going to talk about reclaiming control. So, you know, navigating as a, as a general contractor or, or a builder, navigating the challenges that you've got, you know, in your residential construction business. We're talking mostly to builders, uh, renovators, general contractors as well. Um, but we, we, you know, I think if you're a subcontractor, there's certain things, you know, principles and fundamentals that you can take out of this as well. And a big shout out to any of the apprentices that we've got in the room. Uh, cause I kind of wish, I mean, when I was doing my apprenticeship, it was early nineties. And so YouTube wasn't even a thing. So, uh, if you're sitting there watching me on YouTube, welcome, uh, to all those that are watching. And uh, if you're on the podcast, it's great to be with you as you're cracking down the highway uh, or on the treadmill, uh, or whatever it is that you might be up to. Okay, so look, I think the overview of today is really, you know, s- four situations where, you know, GCs and residential builders can feel like you're out of control and maybe try and outline some practical steps to, uh, you know, assisting you or, you know, to navigate through whatever it is that you're you're in amongst. And, um, and then I guess the ultimate goal is to reclaim the command. Um, you know, I talk a lot about, you know, the fact that, you know, disorder within your business is going, the byproduct of disorder is chaos. But if you're, if you've got order within your business, the byproduct of is control. So we, we want to get you guys and gals back into control or in, in the command 
of of your business rather than either running a business by default instead of design or you know having possibly feeling like the tail is wagging the dog and you know i i spend a lot of time conversing or having conversations with franchisees in smith and sons here in canada as well as uh, elitebusinessadvisory.com clients and you know we we talk a lot about aspects and activities within the business and they the, it's very interesting to listen to them chat with me and using that context saying oh max i've got this going on in the business and it, it's it's chaotic because I don't have control over that. And that then brings us to a, a bit of a head and say, okay, what are we going to do about that? How do we resolve that? What is the what is the the remedy or the solution? And so it's that's what I call teaching, you know, guys and gals in this business how to fish rather than to keep feeding them. Uh, they actually come to that realization and go, I'm a little bit out of control in this part of my business. We need to maybe make some adjustments, improve systems, uh, introduce systems hire and fire accordingly. Um, righto, so I've got three, I think I've got, uh, sorry, four common situations. So the first one is you're at that crossroads. So, you know, do you make the business small again? And I've, you know, I've had these thoughts in my career as well. It's like, um, you might've heard guys say, oh, bugger it, I was making more money when I was when I was just me and a boy or me and an apprentice or whatever, you know? Uh, and yet we all sort of start there and then we, we endeavor to build the business or expand and we hit some, you know, some roadblocks and we like, we throw our hands up. So we, we get to that point where we're like, all right, is this a position where I just go back to what I was doing two years ago uh, or do I keep growing? So that's something to think about. So um, we often face a decision between scaling down operations uh, to maintain quality uh, control or expanding to take on more projects, um, which is where, you know, potentially more money can be made, but we don't really enjoy, um, you know, a, a, you know the, the benefits of that. Um, as easily as what we would think we do. And the, the risk is that we start to begin to feel overwhelmed because it is a pretty large amount to climb. So um, a couple of points there, some practical steps. Um, four, four practical steps would be, well, firstly, to assess your goals. Um, you then got to evaluate your resource. What have you got at your disposal to make that happen? You're probably going to need to seek some advice because if you're going down a road, um, it's easier to actually go down a road that you've not been down before if there's somebody in front of you or down the track that can actually give you some advice, report back. Um, and then, of course, we've got to plan strategically. We really want to make sure that we're not just running this or shooting from the hip or winging it, as some would say. Um, we really want to have a, a very categoric understanding of the, the route that we're going to take. So um, so going back, we want to the practical steps would be we want to revisit our, our business goals and determine if they still align with, you know, the vision of your business. So, you know, crikey, you know, like there's – so many things to think about in the strategic planning uh, phase of the business. And a lot of the time, you know, we we uh, dive into strategic planning, then we move into operations, and then we have some things happen in operations, and then we make reference to things uh, to part that make up parts of our strategic plan. And so it's, it's really important that, um, you know, goal setting is a major part of that. Uh, and we've got to make sure that we are, you know, constantly keeping that uh, at the front of our mind as far as what is the direction that we want to take. Um, resources, obviously, you know, we've got, we can consider financial human resource, uh, operational resources, um, you know, for, for, for the ability to be able to grow the business versus scaling down. So you've got to look at your capacity. So you've got to look at your personal capacity. You've got to look at your financial capacity. You've got to look at your crew capacity and you've got to then be able to look at, okay, do I have a good enough capacity as far as inquiry? Cause it's one thing to set the business up and spend the money for the setup um, but then you've got to make sure that it is sustainable as well. So I talk a lot about those two phases of business development. One of those is operational, and then the other one is expansion. So, you know, it's like I've got to have good operational capital to maintain the business and sustain the business, and then I've got to make sure that I've got good expansion capital if we want to go into the, um, you know, the development of the business. So I talk about consolidation and expansion. Um, and so it's important that we understand that we can't expand the business until we've got allocated expansion capital. What concerns me a lot of the time is when guys go, oh, Max, I'm going to pull on another two guys and I'm going to go and buy that trailer or that vehicle or whatnot. And I'm like, uh, uh, what's your fixed expenses? Well, Max, we need, you know, about $12,000 a month. And I'm like, okay, so how many months worth of fixed expenses have you banked? And they're like, well, none really. And then I'm like, well, okay, so you definitely haven't got any expansion capital. And they're like, well, no, don't be silly. Well, see, guys, the numbers don't lie. So we, you don't need to be 
a gangster KPI person or a gangster accountant to just understand what I just said, meaning that expansion is a no-go. Now, the, the, I would then drill down further as a business coach and say the reason why you haven't got adequate operations capital uh, and the reason why you don't have any expansion capital and probably never will in the short term is because perhaps your pricing model is not good enough or your fixed expenses are too high or your pricing model doesn't work and you're not creating enough gross profit or, you, or you, you know, your delivery of the project. So there's, there's really the outcome for a business that's operating where it should be in the sweet spot, like in the pocket, should be creating operational capital and expansion capital over time. And then the trigger for expansion would be, not that you've got a wild and wonderful idea, it should be the fact that, oh, we have this much funding, we're going to use 60% of that to undertake XYZ, which is really an expansion initiative it's not an operations initiative. And so we really need to compartmentalize that. And so, you know, I think that's part of the mindset around determining, do I go back? Do I have the personal capacity to appreciate the challenge and then embrace the challenge to move forward as, a, as an entrepreneur and develop a business? Or do I know myself well enough to know that, hey, I am not the guy to run this business either by myself or I'm certainly not the guy to develop a business, you know, by myself. So that's where you're at that crossroad where you're saying, do I scale down the business or am I actually, you know, could I live with myself if I did scale down the business and never ventured off and had a crack at building a business? So if you feel like, yeah, I'm a thoroughbred entrepreneur, Max, it's what I want to do. And I'm like, okay, well then, hey, hotshot, you need to start educating yourself around some of those basic principles that I just outlined. Right, number two, it's balancing the act of sales and marketing versus project delivery. So this is another area whereby, you you know, I watch guys that are one man band and, you know, really for my realization, and this is, this is interesting because I've got to then look at now, if I'm talking from corporate CEO of Smith & Sons Canada Inc., if I want to develop the business, a lot of the secrets that I need to uncover so I can develop a better business in the future are actually encapsulated in some of the negative experiences that I've had over the last five years. Does that make sense? And so when we're talking about developing our business, we have to have that. So I'm trying to bring some awareness. So we've got to balance the act of sales and marketing versus project delivery. And that's going to come out of, well, what have I done in the past? How have I balanced sales and marketing and project delivery. So, you know, struggling to balance those two, um, balance the need for sales and marketing efforts with the demands of delivering quality, you know, projects on time, on budget, all that sort of thing, keeping clients happy. That that essentially is the description of the situation that we're talking about. So, um, you know, a few practical steps that we're going to run through here really quick. So we want to create some systems. If we are going to balance sales and marketing, or, you know, the act of sales and marketing versus project delivery, we've got to have systems. So, um, you know, we've, we've made a bit of a change to the logo here in Canada for Smith & Sons. We, we have uh, been able to, uh, I guess, position ourselves to be able to do not just renovations, but also new homes. And so we've taken, uh, you know, we, we've, I guess we've met as, as a corporate board and we've decided that what we want to do is instead of being Smith & Sons remodeling experts, we're now going to be Smith & Sons general contractors. And so, you know, for us, that was something that we determined in-house. Now, the, the very next thing I did, so that was really established in and amongst our franchise group um, yesterday afternoon um, after some conversation with uh, myself and my business partner uh, overseas and, you know, what I did first thing this morning early is that I, uh, I basically sent out a, a memo to everybody that might use our logo for, um, you know, for marketing purposes. And so there was, there was uh, obviously anyone that does our vehicle wraps and our uniforms and our stationery and things like that. But one thing that I thought about just as I was about to hit the send button, because I was thinking about vendors that we use to produce collateral. But then I thought, hang on a minute, we sponsor the, 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 the Vernon Vipers. And so I went, hang on a minute, it's in between hockey seasons, go the Oilers, <laughs> which I know nothing about hockey. So um, they, I know they just got their ass handed to them, poor guys. Um, who, who just won that? Was that Florida? Was it, are they a Florida team? Yeah. Yep. So, um, you know, so 
anyway, we're in between seasons. So I've I've sent this email out to the vice president of the Vipers and he's immediately called me back and said, mate, I was just about to drop an email to reorder all of the logos under the ice. And I'm like, cool. So, you know, that's a responsibility that I had from a corporate standpoint. But, you know, the, the, I guess the luxury that I have, which I know that a lot of builders do not, is that they, they've got to do a lot of sales and marketing and general management, let's say, of the business and quoting and estimating, which is all done at a desk usually, um, versus project delivery, which is very much construction. And so, you know, that really what is, is what it comes down to. It's like I knew straight away that, I, I mean, I didn't exactly have a checklist, but I, I in my mind, I'm like, I need to make sure that everybody gets notification of this immediately because if I if they do not. So if I was to send one email to the Vipers and then we go down to our vehicle wrap company, I'm like, ah, shit, I need to send them the zip folder with all the new logos in it. And then I'm like, oh, where do we get our T-shirts made? And it's like, ah, shit, now I've got to send, you know, Pam uh, an email with that. Like, so that's what I, we're trying to create efficiencies. Now, now that's done um, and we've squared some things away with the, the hockey VP, the, the club, then it's like, I can put that to bed. I move on, right? So we've got to have that, that balance. We want to implement the systems and processes to streamline both sales and marketing and the project delivery options, uh, operations. Um, and, you know, obviously project management software is going to help you do that in the uh, project delivery side of things. Okay, um, you know, we want to delegate wisely. Um, I find too often, whether it's myself or business owners within my EBA uh, coaching network or my franchise network, we're all about, well, I can do it. Oh, I am the guy that can actually do that. The problem is, is we can end up with a laundry list, you know, as long as your left arm of things that we have to do. And so I think we need to not just delegate because like, yeah, I'm too busy, but we've got to be wise in our delegation. And we've got to be wise in how we go about delegating. Um, uh, because if we just go and give them a really macro kind of overview on, oh, this is what I want done, but we don't really get down into micro, we don't have any accountability, we don't have any timelines attached, um, that delegation can pretty much fall flat on its face. Uh, we want to be able to prioritize tasks, um, obviously scheduling tools and things like that, um, you know, that ensure that neither the sales and marketing nor the project delivery suffers. So, you know, I think prioritization in accordance with some level of demand and timeline um, we need to be able to do that because if you don't do that, what's the downside of not prioritization? Uh, overwhelm, because you don't know whether you're punch board or drilled. You don't know, uh, you know, what to do next because you really get the paralysis of analysis. You go, I've got so much to do, um, and you don't know where to start. Okay, so um, we've really got to try and utilize. And there's all kinds of softwares out there, and I would encourage you to just to suck and see a few of them because. There's some things that work for other guys that don't work for me, and there's some things that work for me that don't work for other guys. Like that personalized systemization uh, on how you go about prioritization is it's it's got to be important to you. How you create that um, is 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 super important that you nail down. So always be looking and and really trying to um, you know uh, distill down to what it is. So you don't want a piece of software that you can't get to, or you can't use, or it's clumsy or, or whatever. Um, you know. You've got to make sure that the whole thing is calculated and that it is accessible and that's a very, you know, the, the user interface or the user experience for you is exactly what uh, suits you the best. Um, the other thing with, um, you know, balancing the act of sales and marketing project delivery is uh, obviously monitor the performance. So regular performance metrics such as timelines, client satisfaction, lead conversion rates, that ensures that both sides of the business are effective. Now, if you are a... Uh, if you're an elite business advisory um, client, you will be very, uh, you'll be very familiar with my uh, activity key metrics. And it's interesting because activity key metrics spreadsheet, uh, I've actually got a piece of software that I use for business development. Again, if you're an elite business client or one of my franchisees, you will know of of uh, of that piece of software. Um, and I've approached that software developer to actually introduce my spreadsheet into that software because I'm like, hey, can we consolidate? Can we get it all under one roof? And the email I got back is because I sent him a, you know, a version of it. And I said, well, this is my spreadsheet. Um, and they said, uh, unfortunately, there's there's too much interdependence between cells and we can't, we, we just can't, we, at this point, we, we can't introduce that spreadsheet and make it perform the way it performs in its, you know, native setting in the spreadsheet. And so um, that, you know, to me was unfortunate, but 
the reason is is because we've got everything from on that spreadsheet from your you know and I I run through this spreadsheet a couple of episodes ago and I can't tell you what the number is but it'll be in the 80s that's for sure I think late 70s in the 80s but anyway you'll find it and it's it's really I drilled down over a few episodes I believe in breaking all those columns down right from your revenue target right through to our return on advertising spend and everything in between that so you know if you say hey Max what are the metrics that you follow go and listen to those podcasts and I break it down column by column uh, over over a period of three episodes um, and so you know for me that that accountability is I want to monitor the business not just from a revenue position but I want to look at what my marketing spend is both digitally and local area marketing with say sponsorship and then how does that convert into customer acquisition costs so CAC or down to CPL which is cost per lead and then we work, work into the ROAS which is return on advertising spend and so you know really there's a lot of determining factors that act individually in your business but also are very interdependent um, and some of the activity on the left hand side of the spreadsheet it flushes out particularly in the the CAC the CPL and the ROAS all to do with marketing and you know because ultimately the performance of the business in the way of numbers of contracts signed the dollar values you know of that sign the amount of money we spent on marketing those ratios and um customer acquisition costs and and the the return on advertising spend is all calculated off the performance of the business and then if that's not working it's like okay what are we doing in our marketing message and so anyway super deep uh that was point number two point number three is doing the work yourself versus leading a team and so this is one of i would say one of the most um challenging things subconsciously for us builders because we see somebody doing something in a very clumsy way or a very uh, inefficient way or not at the at the, the the quality level that you would want. And then all we do is we push them aside, metaphorically speaking, and we just go, we'll do it ourselves, you know. Um, by the time I explain it to you, I'm sure you've done this, I've done this. By the time I explain it to you, I could have done it myself. And the problem is next time you come around, you're doing it again and again and again. So you're not actually moving forward. You're just going around the mountain. You're not getting any elevation. You're not getting any expansion. And so I think, you know, that's that's really just the awareness component. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I've, I've done that. And I, I've done it. I'm as guilty as anybody. Um, so, you know, from transitioning from being hands-on um, to effectively leading and managing a team by far is the situation that we find ourselves in that is, you know, fairly challenging or very challenging. Um, you might agree. So, uh, you know, I think we've got to get some practical steps like, developing your leadership skills um you know we've got to enhance your ability to manage and inspire crews that work around us the culture of the business and so if you're a leader that's a bit of a negative nelly uh maybe you're not a risk taker maybe you're you know the, the business you know environment is not fun um then you know really you it's not the case that you can't keep good people it's just they don't want to be around you you stink <laughs> that's a bit brutal uh but anyway you know you know what i'm getting at the principle is it's your ability to lead. The speed of the leader determines the spec. Uh, the speed of the leader determines the speed of the pack. We've really got to nail down. Um, you know, we've got to invest in our leadership training um, and construction management. You know, courses to be able to give ourselves the the enhanced ability to be a good leader. And you know, for some, you might have just rocked into this podcast, and this might be where you've knocked the lid off um, a, some sort of education process. And you know, I really appreciate the emails from, you know, lots of you guys and gals out there that are just giving me a pat on the back for doing what I do. And, you know, there's no ask here. We're just giving back and we really want to change that statistic or have some influence around changing the statistics as, as it relates to the failure rate. And uh, and so, you know, for, for you, this might be a really good source of, you know, an introduction to getting that education. Right. Uh, delegating responsibilities. Um, you know, I think gradually delegating to people within your team is a good way. Um, you know, a system that I use is a four-stage system. So, you know, I often talk to my clients, uh, my, my elite business advisory clients about, you know, what I what I had to do as uh, for my financial administrator in the in the uh, as it related to invoicing our franchisees. And there was a there's a, there was a very busy process. It wasn't just like jump into your local accounting software and pump out an invoice. You know, there was multiple invoices. And there was lots of accountability measures in place uh, based on the performance metrics in the portal. There had to be some downloads with reports and, and then they had to be uh, correlated into an invoice and then they needed to be submitted to the relevant franchisees on an email and there was attachments that needed to be included and things like that. So it was, it was, a, it was a, a process that was quite uh, complex. And so, you know, 
what I needed to do was first thing I did was the moment that I thought I'm going to hand this off, I then come up with uh, an idea around I'm going to build a PowerPoint with snapshots or screenshots that have been introduced into that PowerPoint with little text, you know, uh, prompts on that as well. And I really developed the what I call the playbook for um, franchise uh, invoicing. That was pretty much what we called it. And it wasn't, it was probably a 10 page document. And, but it essentially was a guide for that financial administrator. Now, further to that, not, I didn't just go, here you go, here's a, a manual. So I had to invest the time to build the manual. And then I didn't just drop it on her desk and go, oi, you got to do that. Th then it became a four stage process. So this is what I did. I said, right, first of the month, we're now going to invoice. You're going to watch me. And that's the first thing that happened. Watch. And then, of course, after we got done, there was a bit of a debrief. The second thing that, that we did is that I was going to do it and then she was going to watch and ask questions along the way and I was going to ask some questions about what she thought I should do next. She would have the playbook. And then that way there was a little bit more integration. There was a little bit more understanding. So there was a little bit more pressure, not a lot of pressure, but just a little bit more pressure because I was going to ask, okay, what do you think I should do next? And she might have had to go to the book or she would kind of go, okay, that's what I think has got to happen. No, not quite. Let's look at the book. And, and then she would reconcile that across what was what I was going to do next. And so that was the second phase of play in our, really, it's an apprenticeship program. It's like, how do I train someone who has no clue? Because let's face it, as apprentices, we knew nothing to being a qualified carpenter. Well, this is the same, but it's, it's, it wasn't a four-year process. It was essentially about a four-month process. So the third phase of play was that, right, you put yourself in the seat. You ask questions of me. You've got the book there. Um, I will I will look over your shoulder and we'll make sure that we get through this month's billings, um, you know, in that regard, uh, you know, accurately and confidently and, and coherently. And then, of course, and that was where there was some, inter there was some uh, you know, some conversation and we were able to collaborate around, you know, while she was driving. But then the fourth month, the fourth and final time. Now, there's a point here where if you hit phase three and things aren't working, you need to back up to phase two. You get back in the seat then you start asking questions and you go through that phase two program again, throw, throw it back into phase three. Right, you're in control. I'm here. You've got the book. Let's collaborate. Let's see how you go. Now, once my confidence got to a level where I was happy with the way that, that she delivered, I was then confident to go into the final phase, which is phase four, which was all about right now. You are doing this. I am going to let you do it until such time as I think there's a critical moment in the timeline that we can't get back and I will stop you. So that pretty much meant that she was on her own, but I was, I was supervising, okay? Now, uh, side note, a quick pivot. I've watched Gordon Ramsay do this countless times with these people that have got black jackets in his kitchen and he'll get them to run what they call the pass. Now, by this time, there's, you know, 14 tragic episodes of where people just have the shit kicked out of them for the most part. Um, but then what he does is he gets them up on the pass, which now you're the sous chef. You're actually running the whole kitchen. You've got people on meat stations, fish stations, um, you know, garnish stations. And so what they do is they, to, because they're working the pass, they put one of uh, Gordon Ramsay's sous chefs on there and they actually put some sabotage items in there for the prospective sous chef who's now working the pass in the black jacket uh, to basically see whether they can pick it or not, like whether they can catch it. And sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't. And so that's before the food would go out, Gordon would say, okay, taste it. You didn't get this. This was the wrong, this, this, wasn't, a, this wasn't a mashed potato. It was something else. And so they do that because what they're trying to do is tune up their senses to and a high level of awareness to make sure they're doing things well. So when we're talking about, you know, delegating responsibilities, we want to make sure that when we do delegate, we delegate at the highest level of competency. Because if we do it right at the start, even though it's hard and might be long, you know, it might take a long time. Look, at, it would take me half an hour to do invoicing for franchises. When I built that PowerPoint, it took me two hours. But then what it did is for in perpetuity, it then it kept paying me back because I never had to do invoicing again. And the result was always at the highest level, almost perfectly every time. That's the, that's the, return, on, on, or that's the return on investment, okay? Um, now, um, to, to my point um, about delegating responsibility, we need to empower our team in the process. And so the word empower means to transfer power from me to you. If, you are, if you're one of my team, or you're one of my coaching clients, or you're one of my franchisees. What I want to do is transfer the power. It doesn't necessarily mean that I lose anything, but what I want to do is I want to transfer it 
so that the power that that or the confidence let's call it you know let, maybe we use that word confidence a level of confidence i want to bring my team up to speed with that level of confidence the same you know as what i'm doing and so you know making sure that we don't go in and and you know i had this conversation with one of my clients this week um you know shout out to kev in uh, in london and you know it was really about that um we we didn't want I, I think we we don't want to micromanage in you know in perpetuity. That's what we don't want to do. But I was talking about there's sometimes where we actually want our team to fail because it's those it's the skinned knees that actually trigger the brain to remember I don't want that to happen again. That's painful. I'm going to correct my behaviour and this is what's going to be the outcome next time instead of me getting in there and I, I think I use the the analogy you know where where my we want our kids to be safe you know but there's sometimes that to, to help ki- you know my kids understand or improve there's sometimes we would let them go down that route and and taste that and then they go oh that was a mistake or I didn't you know do what I should have done and there's some there's a learning curve there and so in a weird way that's the transfer of understanding from you as the leader to your team you're empowering the team why what you've heard this saying knowledge is power well where do you think knowledge comes from it comes from experiences that unfortunately are mostly negative and then out of that no out of that experience comes wisdom and wisdom is is knowing that next time i won't do that again that's wisdom you you try something you fail so you have an experience and then you basically get yourself an education so that next time you don't pay the idiot tax and hurt yourself. That's essentially what we're coming up with. So empower your team, right? Uh, communicate clearly. Obviously on the wall here, we've got, um, you know, we value open, honest communication. So we've not only got to have open lines, but we've got to have clear, concise communication methods or platforms. And so, you know, I've talked about this before. If I send you a text message, uh, no response is, is not acceptable, Okay because I need your acknowledgement that that communication has hit your inbox or has hit your your text message and you've got your eyes on it. Because if what, what can happen is if you look at it and you go, I'll get back to that and you don't, it's lost, it's lost, okay? And so all about, you know, communication or you're like, if you were to call me right now and um, my phone was to ring, I could pick it up and go, hey, I'm in a meeting, I'll call you back when I'm done, boom, send. Now, they're not just going, well, he's ignoring me or he's ghosting me. It's not like that. So I tend to deal with stuff front on and at 100 miles an hour because I've got to, you know, there's so much coming down the conveyor belt. There's so much, uh, so many responsibilities and there's so many tasks that for me, I've got to be able to be very clear and concise in how I deal with that. And a lot of that comes down to clear and concise communication. So uh, we've got to ensure that everyone's aligned um, with the project goals and the quality standards. Number four, and this is the last one uh, for the sake of time, I better wrap up quick. Um, 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 The business owner identity crisis. This is an interesting one. And really what it comes down to, the situation is we struggle to balance our personal identity with a business leader identity. And I know this might be a bit of a weird one to round up on, but I, I want to encourage you guys that, you know, well, look, let's use Gordon Ramsay as another example, right? I mean, the guy is ferocious and prickly as anything, <laughs> as prickly as anything in the kitchen. But it's amazing, like when, you know, if you're one of those teams and you win one of the challenges and you end up, you know, um, you know, getting flown by a helicopter to some bloody, you know, wine wine vineyard or whatever they call it and there's lunch and he, he bobs in and he's like, I'm not the chef here, My, you know, I'm Gordon, right? So, you know, and I'm sure, and, and of course, I've even heard his daughter say once on, on one of the episodes that, He's not this angry at home. And I just think that, you know, I think we've got to get comfortable because I know that there's a part of me, if I ask, you know, my wife and my kids, they would say there's there's a difference in personality between what that human is like at work and what he's like at home. Um, you know, there's obviously a, a little bit of a blended or an overlap, you know, in, in the behavior, but there's there is distinctly different levels. And so, we can struggle to balance the 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 appreciation of our identity because over here we're one type of guy and i deal i do business with a lot of guys and gals in their 20s and 30s who've got new families and things like that and you know it's i see the struggle because you do have to be a little bit of a 
oh, what's a nice word? What's a nice way of saying it? You've got to be firm at work. You know, you, you can't take any bullshit. It is a little bit dog eat dog. Um, and, you know, everyone's trying to really ring you out, you know, like how much juice is in that squeeze. And you do have to be a little bit combative and you do have to be very assertive and very confident and very firm. Um, and a lot of the time you might compromise, and I do, I compromise some, uh, you know, some niceties because I'm just here to get the job done. And I don't give a shit about your feelings. You know, you're in business, so welcome to the game. Um, and yet when you, when I go home, I'm definitely a lot more empathetic. I'm not. It's not that I don't have empathy at work, but there's a greater level of empathy at home because I'm with people that mean a lot to me um, that I'm with forever. And so some, you know, it's easy for me to reconcile and go, well, it's, it's not worth going to battle over that because I prefer the relationship over the end result of that argument or whatnot. Like sometimes I stand my ground, majority of the time I might just lay down my guns. So, you know, the behavior is going to be different for you and different elements of your life and that's okay. But it's up to you. I guess here I go again, bringing awareness to something that you may not have considered before. And so, um, you know, we really want to then maybe, um, now that we've understood that, what is some practical steps or what's the education around that? I'm just going to run through really quick. So practical steps might be self-reflection. So you need to just focus on your values, you know, and your passions and how they align with your business. So from a personal standpoint, you know, and just try and maybe create some separation. And you know what, guys, I think it's important that we, we just, we forgive ourselves, you know, because I think we worry too much about what other people think. And then we put way too much pressure on ourselves to achieve things in our own life that are not achievable, because it's not you. It's just not you. So really, you know, pay, pay attention, sit in the hammock, you know, with your sunglasses on, stare into the clouds and just really understand, you know, try and listen to who you are and, and how you get the maximum performance out of you, okay? Um, set boundaries, obviously clear boundaries between work and personal life. That's super important. That'll help you maintain a healthy balance and then allocate time for both, you know, your, your personal interests and your family. Um, and, uh, you know, seek support too. That's, that's another thing. You know, mental health is super, you know, is super important in our uh, business operations, Guys and girls, it's kind of like if we don't take care of our home life, our business life becomes challenging. I want to tell you that if you're, you, you know, your mental health is not in check and you really don't have um, a really good understanding on what's going on in your head, um, that can be devastating to you and your family if you don't get that right. So I'd encourage you to, you know, the whole thing, are you okay? That type of thing really needs to be uh, taken seriously. But, you know, I, I think, you know, as much as you, you may have to get a therapist for something like that, um, you know, a business coach might help so just go, look, I'm really cool mentally, I'm fine but I've really got a lot of chaos happening in my business. And that's where, you know, someone like myself might be able to help you with some, you know, developing some clarity because when you get an unemotional objective set of eyes like mine on your business, um, and I think a lot of my elite business advisory clients and my franchised operators, because they've all been, you know, at varying degrees in what I'd call a valley, for me to be able to step back and not be judgmental, but really process things um, objectively and unemotionally and, and really, you know, productively, um, you know, there's there's something in a lot of the counsel that I bring to the table, which, you know, based on the feedback that I'm getting, um, it just brings clarity to, you know, a lot of the people that are in my charge, you know, people I'm responsible to, so, or responsible for. Um, right, the fine thing is to redefine success. You know, I really, you know, I've got a, a big highlighted note here and it says personal and business goal alignment. You know, when I train guys in this room and we've, there's a slide that I put up in my PowerPoint presentation and I think it's in day four where, where we're talking about strategic planning and business development. And I'll round out with this, guys and gals. Um, is that, you know, there's no point in having a $5 million goal um, if you, when you understand the demand that's going to be on you on the next two to three years in the way of, you know, recruitment, pricing models, um, systemization, uh, accountability, uh, the financial pressure, if that is going to detract away from your effectiveness at home and the peace that you have at home currently. Um, you need to, as you grow the business, you need to be aware that if it does stay, start to take a toll on your ability to function at home as a, you know, competent partner, um, or or you seem to be bringing home a lot of the attitude from work, which I've been guilty of, then you need to start reassessing and maybe slow down the game. So you go, okay, I wanted to achieve five million in the next three years. I don't think that I think that's going to be detrimental to my personal life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch that out to a five million. You know. It's better to arrive at the mountain alive than die halfway up the mountain, you know? And so, you know, I really urge you to really consider and redefining um, to ensure that it really encompasses personal fulfillment, well-being, and satisfaction, you know, of completing 
you, you, you know, you, or building that business so that you can be proud of because we all want to do that. We want to tick a lot of boxes at the end of the day. We want to have great gross profit, really good, you know, working environment, great culture within the business, um, you know, have really happy clients and, of course, produce that little net profit at the end of the year where that's pretty much the pat in the back going, right, that's confirmation that everything I did in the last 12 months, that where, where, I, where I reached a net profit of 10%, I'm, I'm golden. Like, I've just got to repeat that and just maybe add a zero, something along those lines. So, um, you know, guys and gals, we really want to, um, you know, implement these steps that I've outlined, regain control, achieve, achieve a healthier, more balanced approach to managing your, your contracting or your building company, um, building companies. And uh, really, you know, I guess, you know, the goal of business is to stay in business. And that means your, you know, financial well-being is important. Um, your mental well-being is important and your personal well-being is important as well. We need to check those boxes. So, Guys and gals, um, like and subscribe if you're on YouTube, all that good stuff. Great to have you along for the ride. And um, don't forget, max at elitebusinessadvisory.com or you can go check out what's on my website there, elitebusinessadvisory.com and uh, would love to hear from you. Go build a kick-ass business. See you in the next episode. Cheers, guys and gals. Yeah.